over 20 years and most of that time in the water program. Lynn has had a lifetime interest in and commitment to authentic citizen involvement in public processes. Lynn first began to see possibilities when she coordinated a citizens advisory committee process in the Minnesota River Basin in the early 1990s. More recently, Lynn, along with her colleagues, has focused on making the case for greater civic engagement in watershed projects statewide. She has been given the opportunity to focus on this emerging field of work when in 2008, the state legislature gave public agencies and private organizations the charge of bringing more stakeholders and citizens to the table in solving water problems. Lynn has worked with a variety of local governments as they take the lead in engaging citizens. She's also focusing extra time and effort within the St. Croix River Basin where interest and engagement is rapidly expanding across the river basin. The other panelist joining us is Janet Haywood. She is a citizen who lives in the Como neighborhood of St. Paul. She became interested in the health of Minnesota's freshwater resources through her involvement with the Citizens League water policy work in 2008 and 2009. In 2009, she and her fellow Como neighbors founded the Como Lake Neighborhood Network. The purpose of the network is to create a clear, meaningful leadership role for the members of the public to help solve the problem of too much phosphorus flowing into Como Lake from the surrounding watershed in partnership with local government and to provide a supportive, collaborative network structure to co-develop and co-implement community-scale, citizen-led, phosphorus source reduction solution strategies. Thank you, and we will begin the presentation uh, this morning in just a uh, minute here as I switch over to Lynn Colsey. All right, hello everyone in webinar land. I really appreciate you joining us today. I, as, as Darrell said, I work at the Pollution Control Agency in the Watershed Division. And um, I, in my work in civic engagement for MPCA, we've been spending the last three to four years looking at a number of innovative approaches for engaging more citizens in watershed planning and, and uh, management, moving very far beyond the traditional approaches we've used with uh, public meetings and, and things like that. And we spent a good deal of time looking at the best ways to more fully integrate citizens into the watershed projects from the early stages. So to, over time what we really hope to accomplish is that we build uh, civic capacity within local communities for solving water problems together and, and so it's more a more sustainable approach than we've taken in the past. We're also looking at a number of best practices that could be used to design uh, effective and authentic public processes, ones that give uh, residents a real voice in the decisions about water issues that impact them and matter to them. So what we're seeing is that good things are starting to happen in civic engagement around the state. We are definitely moving in the right direction and in large part thanks to our local partners who have been kind of the guinea pigs in trying new ways of doing business around water management and in, uh, especially in the non-point world of water management. So while we're doing really well, I think, in our early endeavors, it's, I think, very important also to look at the underlying governing structures and ways that we work and make decisions together in watersheds in order to ensure that all the work that we're doing and the input we're getting from the public add up and end up resulting in success on the ground. So our presentation today, Jana and I, uh, would be to cover uh, several topics and we're trying to make the case first that our current approaches to governing water resources need a fresh look, that a new approach, you know, talk about what that new approach might look like, how it could benefit our efforts to improve and protect water at the watershed scale, while it, why it's important to see ourselves, all of us, as active citizens in relationship within a complex civic web where we'll, we are are all focused on the common goal of clean water and how the pilot project Jan and I are working on might help us to discover a better way to collaboratively govern for water quality. 
I think most of you probably know we've spent the last 40 years putting a tremendous amount of effort into addressing water pollution, and we can't deny the phenomenal su success that we've had in addressing point sources of pollution. Really, we have made tremendous progress there. But even despite all the money we've spent there and the great successes we've had on, the, on addressing point sources of pollution, we still have a significant number of, of water bodies that are impaired, and many of those remaining problems are related to non-point source pollution. The diffuse sources of pollution that um, move pollutants to our lakes, rivers, and streams through storm runoff and snow melt. Most of these non-point sources remain um, unregulated, and we've relied largely on voluntary approaches, asking citizens to do what they can to change practices on their own property or land to address non-point sources of pollution. And I think many of us in the field who've been around a while feel like we might have hit a wall there and that we're not seeing the results that we'd, we'd hoped for. Kind of undergirding all of this is a real challenge we're facing with the public out there that is becoming increasingly cynical and uh, skeptical about government and civic life, and many of them are checking out of public processes. And they're the very people we need to help us solve these very complex and wicked public problems such as non-point source pollution. So I think many of us feel that it, we're not feeling that we're making the progress we'd, we'd hoped for. and We still have over 40% of waters in Minnesota not meeting water quality standards. And we, just in the water sh watersheds and that we have monitored and assessed so far, we've already got over 2,000 water bodies that we've identified as not meeting water quality standards. And it will require some significant work to create implementation plans for restoring those waters through our major watershed plans. So we are, as I said, making a case that our existing ways of, of governing water are really creating challenges that hamper our ability to be as successful as we'd like. We have had a model which makes government, you know, very much responsible for fixing the problem and doing that pretty much alone. We at, in government are expected to have all the answers. Citizens have played a very minor role in the past, by and large, and we've typically involved them after we've already created a plan about the place where they live, and they are only allowed to comment on those plans. We have put a lot of reliance on technology solving problems, which in some realms works extremely well, but with non-point source, I think this is an area where we're going to need a lot more involvement from people and understanding their values along with the science that we have to work with. And also, not through anybody's fault, but the way we have structured organizations and the many, many organizations in Minnesota that deal with water issues, it ends up creating a lot of silos. It makes it very difficult to work across organizations to accomplish things. And even when there's this desire to do that, sometimes the structural elements of our organizations and, and laws and so forth make that challenging to do. We also have spent a good deal of effort over the last 30 or 40 years collecting data, synthesizing the data, and packaging data, hoping to get information out to the public and, and thinking if we do that and explain the problems that it will trickle down to the general public and lead people to make changes in their activities or practices. Um, it, this has had mixed results, as I'm sure many of you realize. Many of the articles and books that I've read recently are telling us that the public is listening to experts if in government less and less, and that's a real concern because we have critical information to share, and we want to be sure that good science is part of the process. But the way in which we are currently sharing this information in a kind of top-down manner and not allowing for serious dialogue and, and integration of the data that we're presenting is creating another barrier to us working well together. So I think Jan and I agree, and that's why we're involved in the pilot we're going to talk about, that we are really at an important crossroads and in our work in water quality. I think we can continue on the existing path we're on, feeling frustrated by our lack of progress, or we can look at new ways of doing our work. 
and you know that really starts with a new vision. The government-led kind of top-down approaches that we've used have been effective to a point, but I think now we're reaching the limits of some of that, and um, we, you know well, there's a ceiling that we've hit a wall of some kind. And many other organizations out there that I've read about in the other sectors are facing similar challenges and similar feelings. You look at healthcare, social services, um, education, even business. A lot of them are understanding that they can't do this work alone. They've got to figure out how to make a bigger role for uh, citizens and stakeholders in the work that they do. So what's the a potential solution strategy for the challenges that we face and our lack your current kind of feelings of lack of progress? I think we feel that our challenges in this area is going to take a, a very big picture approach and a, a new vision, a new kind of way of thinking about how we do this work. And it's one that we're hoping will help build the governing capacity in all of us so that we can work together better to solve problems together. And no one organization or sector is going to be uh, expected to fix this on their own. So we do what we're hoping to work on, work toward, is to create a governing approach where citizens are very much a part of the process of developing a vision and, and goals and objectives and so forth for trying to address an, a, a specific water body's problems and to do that with an understanding that, they, that we all have an obligation to govern for the common good. And that's a very kind of different philosophy than many of us have had in the past. We know that this work is it's important that we, if, in order to do something like that, we have to have some shared civic principles and standards that will guide us to that vision, which is kind of a higher level purpose that we can work together toward that will keep us on track when we want to get lost in the details. And we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit more about civic principles and standards later, but we feel those are so very important to a new way of thinking about water management. And then also giving a much bigger role to um, citizens as problem solvers and policy makers. And we're understanding, of obviously, that agencies have legal obligations and, and have to make decisions. But there's a lot more room, I think, for allowing people who are impacted by a problem to have a say in solutions. We also want to encourage a sense of shared responsibility and accountability for getting this, this work done together and, and to take some of the glory together too when you ready you when you actually you do succeed. So Jana is going to talk later about the pilot project we're working on and it uses a specific framework called civic organizing which incorporates a lot of these concepts I've shared on this page. And it really what it attempts to do is to link the work and practices of mul multiple organizations who care about water and citizens and so that they can work together to produce better outcomes in, in for the common good of water, not, not just looking at self-interest. At the center of this approach is, is that the concept that we all need, need to be part of the governing structure that encourages better coordination, collaboration, and responsibility for water quality. And it really is a framework that I think helps keep our collective eyes on the prize of a common good versus simply looking at our self-interest. But it's very unique in that way. So this is a idealized visualization of what collaborative governance could look like, what this vision could look like, and it makes all parties responsible and obligated to govern for the common good of water, and it puts citizens at the center of this activity because we are citizens no matter where we are, no matter where we work, uh, where we worship, where we, um, you know, whatever, wherever we are. And this is a very different kind of thinking about water than the traditional hierarchical kind of approach, top-down approach from government. And we know that this model doesn't exist yet, and it's right now it's a very government-centric system. And what we do need to, I think, do over time is to try to replace that with one that is requires a shared responsibility for getting this work done. So again, the important concept here is we're all citizens obligated to govern together, and that's a, a, um, a series of skills or a set of skills that we I think we have to learn together and embrace in order to get this work done. So how can we reach this vision? I think it has to start with a big picture goal, a big picture vision like this, but it really is going to require us reimagining our civic roles. We spent a lot of time over the last 
last, I don't know, 30, 40 years thinking about our private lives. And, and that's, and in many ways, our sense of being in a, having a public life is, is atrophied, I think, across the board. And I think the having a bigger sense of a public life obligates us to be part of solving problems. So that's something I think we have to encourage people to embrace. We also have to figure out ways in government and other places to reward and, and institutionalize a different mindset around how we manage water instead of, um, you know, and really rewarding when people do reach across organizations and work together well. But then we have to also, this is the, the, the difficult part, and but so important and worthy, is trying to create a civic infrastructure within which we can do this work and create relationships and, and trust that really gets work done. And it's really almost like creating a web of, of organizations and citizens that work together um, with a higher purpose and goal of um, protecting our water. And finally, I think one thing that government can do is to give citizens more opportunities to practice being an, an active citizen. And that means moving beyond having people come to single, you know, one public meeting and then leave, but instead encouraging them to be part of a long-term public dialogue about water, where they feel obligated as citizens to struggle through these difficult questions and challenges together. So I think government's role there can be in playing as um, a convener and also in providing a lot of the scientific expertise, which is so important to making good public decisions. Now, many of you might be saying, well, Lynn is truly an idealist, and this is, this is a very challenging vision that's been set out here. But I think it's important to, to have those loftier visions to get us started toward a new approach. I think um, one of the challenges I see to accomplishing a more collaborative approach is that one of the barriers is how we think about governing. Right now, I think we think of governing in a very narrow way, and we see it as something someone else does somewhere else out there, and we see ourselves often as victims or, or somehow we're passive in this process. And the, the work that we're, we're trying to do, Jana and I, is to, to encourage people to think differently, that, that we are all governing members of a society. We all govern in the places where we work and our families. We have, we have influence. And once we see ourselves as having the ability to solve problems wherever we are, even if it's a small sphere of influence, I think that our ability to imagine ourselves as part of the solution within the larger society and sphere really deepens and expands, and we no longer feel so victimized by what's going on around us. So we have to find ways to encourage people to, to practice that and, and feel good that they can actually have impact. So that's really, I think, part of our vision as well. You know, we all have so much in common, and I think the media has convinced us that we're either red or we're blue or we're polarized or whatever, but the, the research I've read says that that's really not true, and we have tremendous values in common in, in this country and in this state. And we're all, we're all citizens who need to have influence in our, in our democracy. And each of us in our private lives are making decisions on a daily basis that has some level of public impact. And because of that, I think we're obligated as citizens in a democracy to figure out ways in which we can help to, to address whatever impacts we may be causing and in the sense of working toward a common good. And there's a very much of a higher purpose or aspiration here that I think people can be called to and want to be called to. In my work so far, people are so appreciative of opportunities to have meaningful input on a public issue. They're really craving a, a meaningful functional, collaborative, civic life. And I think that's the job we have in government is to give them those opportunities and to kind of re and hopefully can model a different way. The structures for doing this work are not there yet, but I think, as I said, it's our job to build this and to really build on the good work that we're already doing out there. So to kind of wrap up my part of this, I think that um, there are some essential elements or structures needed to work well together in watersheds, and I, I think very critically that one of those is having a common, commonly agreed to set of civic principles and standards to guide how people are going to make decisions together at a watershed scale. And that includes things like creating uh, watershed plans, implementing them, you know, making policies around water, and, and even in how we evaluate how well we're doing. And without these grounding principles, 
and we often don't take time to create these grounding civic principles. I think the danger is that civic engagement can become a lot of activities, and it isn't going to necessarily um, allow us to know where we're going and uh, really accomplish things on the ground as we hoped. So one, this is what we are trying to encourage our watershed partners to do is to take the time at the beginning of a project to establish civic principles and standards and it, it puts them out in a very intentional way in the community. And it really tells people who you are, what you believe in or aspire to, what values are grounding the work of your organization, and what um, people should hold you accountable to. And I think setting this out in an intentional way is incredibly powerful for, for the public and will, I think, draw people to a process when they really understand what the goals or aspirations of a watershed group is. And similarly, um, standards help you meet those principles, achieve those principles, and they're very important too. And several of the examples of standards are, you know, all those people are impacted by a problem are asked to help define the problem and create solution strategies around them. People have have to be willing to come to the table contributing resources and not just complaining. And we really actively engage people in policy making, not relegating citizens off to a corner to um, you know, hear information. And we want them to be directly involved in policy making and understanding that someone of that, you know, maybe perhaps in a government organization is going to have to make the final decision on that. Uh, we also know that we need structures and strategies to support good public process. So when people come to meetings, they feel it's been a great experience, they've been heard and respected, they've, they've enjoyed hearing in a safe environment what other people are thinking and sharing. And in our experience in doing this work so far, people are so enjoying, like I said, an opportunity for a, a really a good civil conversation with their neighbors around issues about water. We also need to work on creating this this complex, interwoven, interdependent civic web of organizations and, and people and relationships and so forth. I think that is underestimated aspect of getting work done well. And finally, um, organizing people to take small-scale actions where they can start practicing some of this and, and get some results that make them believe that we can be functional in working together across disciplines between government and citizens and so forth and, and showing some impact. And I think through small-scale successes, we will start believing that this, is, that this work is feasible and we can do it well together. And Jana is going to talk now about the pilot projects that we're working on where we're trying to put a lot of these concepts into action on the ground and taking that look at a very small scale project to see if, if we can um, show benefit from a collaborative mindset and a civic mindset around this work. But I'm going to let Jana take it from here. Thank you, Lynn. Just a second, Jana will uh, begin her presentation. Okay. Uh, so, as Daryl mentioned in the beginning, my name is Janet Kaywood and I'm a resident of the Coma neighborhood in St. Paul. Um, and my part of this presentation is to describe, as Lynn said, um, a pilot project that she and I are part of. Um, and hopefully, so far in this in this presentation, we've what we're wanting to is to make the case that um, our current water quality challenges, which are mostly caused by non-point sources of pollution, um, that that those challenges need a water governance system that considers uh, everyone, uh, no matter who we are, what sector we're in, uh, government agencies, nonprofits, businesses, universities, community members, uh, pretty much everybody has a governing role um, by virtue of the fact that the decisions and practices that we all engage in um, that have public impact on our water resources, those are in fact governing decisions. Um, so that's one point we're hoping to make. The other is that uh, in this new or hopefully improved water governance 
system uh, that that should be based on the role we all have in common, um, which is that we are all citizens in a democracy with the obligation to uh, govern together in the interest of the common good. So those are a couple points that hopefully we've been making the case for. Um, and as Lynn mentioned, what's missing in order to do that um, is a shared set of civic principles and standards that guide our decision making in this this civic web of governing Minnesotans that we're imagining here, um, and the structures and processes needed for this uh, civic governing system to work. Um, so uh, Lynn and I are were involved in a pilot project with um, a couple of organizations, the Citizens League, um, which is a civic nonprofit in Minnesota. Some of you might be familiar with it. Um, they engage, engage citizens from all walks of life in uh, public uh, conversations about public uh, policy issues. Um, and then another organization, Civic Organizing Incorporated, which is uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the developer of the uh, framework of uh, civic organizing. So this is actually the, the framework that Lynn and I are are using in our pilot. Um, it's a it's a framework that provides um, a set of civic principles, standards, structures, and processes um, uh, that Lynn mentioned earlier. Um, and she and I can both integrate um, this framework with our the existing approaches that we're using to do our work um, in water. Um, and we're we're curious to see if we can get better outcomes in our water quality goals by using this new approach to uh, governing and to policy making. And what you see here, it's a very simplified um, diagram of the civic organizing framework. But um, it, w what we're hoping you might do is go actually to the website of, of this organization. This is, the framework is actually used by a consortium of organizations called the Minnesota Active Citizenship Initiative, or MACI, um, as they call themselves. So if anybody wants to see the details of the civic organizing framework, they can go to MACI's website, um, which is activecitizen.org. It is a very detailed framework, and we didn't really have time to go through all of it here during this presentation. But um, that is the framework that we're using. And the, the organizations you see listed here are the organizations that are part of that consortium. Um, so how are Lynn and I actually applying this framework to our work in water? Um, a key component of the framework is that we, we ask ourselves, where do I have impact and where do I have the authority to act? Um, so for me, I live in the Como neighborhood in St. Paul, so that's where I am applying this approach. And the, the work that I'm doing with my neighbors, uh, we're trying to reduce the phosphorus pollution that's flowing to Como Lake. Um, and for Lynn, she's actually using the approach in her work with um, a couple of counties, Kennebec um, and Mille Lacs County, in, uh, in their work uh, in the Snake River watershed. Um, so I'll just say a little bit about how we're using the, this uh, frame, the civic organizing framework in Como, and then just briefly talk about what's going on in Como. Um, it is an, an impaired lake um, due to excessive phosphorus concentrations, a, a problem that's common for a lot of, of urban lakes in Minnesota. Um, and the result, of course, is a degraded lake uh, that's dominated by um, algal blooms, um, and, um, and it, which, of course, causes this cascade of negative ecosystem impacts. Um, so the, the lake is unstable. It's, it's unable to regulate itself. Um, it's, it's very unhealthy healthy. Um, so where is all that phosphorus coming from? Um, we, my neighbors and I learned that it actually originates from the surrounding lake shed, um, which you see pictured here. Um, it's, the lake shed itself is actually 24 times the size of the lake. Um, and bear in mind that Como Lake is a shallow lake too, so this is a, a very challenging um, lake for, for us to manage. Um, the uh, issue is compounded by the fact that in Como we have a very dense tree canopy, so lots of organic material accumulates, um, and over a third of the lake shed is impervious surfaces. So, you know, streets, rooftops, sidewalks, driveways, patios, parking lots. Um, so with that, a lot of runoff is created when it rains. So all that debris, a lot of organic material that, that collects, especially in the street gutters um, that you see pictured here, um, when all that debris um, mixes with the runoff, the runoff flows through that material phosphorus is then leached out, um, and that uh, that nutrient-rich stormwater then flows into our storm sewers, which um, in our neighborhood, um, most of our storm sewers actually discharge to Como Lake. Um, so just picture a lot of nutrient-rich stormwater flowing to Como Lake, um, and a lot of it is coming from all this organic material. Um, so what is being done about it? A lot, actually. Um, we have um, some pretty dedicated local government agencies who um, they have a strategic plan that they are advancing. Uh, and the local uh, government agencies for us would be Capital Region Watershed District, 
Um, and then there's three cities um, that have land area within the lake shed that drains to, to Como Lake, uh, St. Paul, Roseville, and Falcon Heights. So they all work together, um, and they've installed several underground structures to infiltrate stormwater into the ground. Uh, mostly they work with engineering consultants on those kinds of projects, uh, but they've actually been increasing their work with residents in recent years. They've installed quite a few rain gardens, um, and they've, uh, in partnership with residents, and they've, uh, they've launched a downspout redirection project, which has been uh, quite successful. So they're doing a lot of work um, to try and address this, this challenging uh, water management situation. In the meantime, uh, those of us residents who actually live in the lake shed, we live at the source. Um, we feel like we could be playing a much larger role than we have been. Um, a lot of the lake shed is private properties that are small enough that they're not regulated. Um, so a lot of it is up to us to just take the initiative to, to get involved. Um, and given that we, like I said, we live at the source where the where the phosphorus is actually entering um, our, our storm sewers. Um, so we feel like we have an important role to play and we need to develop that role. Um, so a group of us neighbors, we formed ourselves into the Como Lake Neighbor Network uh, as a means to coordinate um, the household decisions and practices that we all make as individuals. We want to coordinate those decisions um, that have an impact on Como Lake. And in particular, we want to be, we've been learning about uh, positive practices that we can engage in at the household level. So we want to actually coordinate those practices across the community. Community, um, in a more strategic way. Um, so one strategy that we're advancing right now, um, we it's a phosphorus source reduction strategy. Uh, we call it the Como Curb Cleanup. It's actually based on um, a program model uh, that we learned from the Freshwater Society and Friends of the Minnesota Valley. They have a, a program called Community Cleanups for Water Quality. So the basic model, it's really a very ingenious, uh, very simple yet very powerful model um, that's easily adapted by other communities. Um, so that's what we've we've done. We've adapted it to the Como neighborhood. Um, we've, it's grown. Um, it just is specific to Como, and we've uh, we've taken it up to the community scale, and we've added a lot of cross-sector partners. So it's really been um, a wonderful uh, strategy for us to engage in. Um, the point of it is that neighbors across the lake shed, we work together in the fall, and we basically go out and remove the organics from street gutters in front of, of our own homes. So we do this during October. Um, the we do have city street sweepers that uh, come through at the end of the season and capture what remains or what's reaccumulated. But um, the idea is that we residents are out there cleaning up uh, this material as it falls because it'll sit there for weeks on end. And when it rains, of course, uh, phosphorus would leach out and get into our storm sewers and into the lake. So if we are out there cleaning it up during uh, October, then when the sweepers come through and catch the rest, um, it feel, it's, a, it's a good partnership between us and our, our local government agencies. To, to do this in a critical watershed, um, lake shed like Como's. Um, another photo of our some neighbors. Actually, this is a, a group of graduate students who worked with us from Carlson. They were great. Um, and then at the end of the event, um, neighbors basically take all the material that they rake from their curb only. We're not actually collecting water, or excuse me, uh, yard debris. Um, it, it all gets taken to drop off sites, and we fill up these dumpsters, and ultimately the material gets carted off to the local uh, yard waste site to be composted. Um, so what we are hope that we're doing in all of this is that we are aligning our our household practices, taking the, you know coordinating them at the community scale, and um, in the hopes that we are advancing a, a common vision that we all share, which is that we want to restore Como Lake. Um, so in this sense, um, we feel like we are problem solvers and we are actually advancing solution strategies together. Here's a quick list of the, the cross-sector partners. Um, Capital Region Watershed District gives us grant money to do the project, so they've been wonderful to work with. City of St. Paul's been wonderful. Uh, really everyone on this list, we've got this wonderful list of partners, um, and they've all been very eager to help us. Um, and actually, in looking at this list, it seems like this is a great opportunity to uh, for us to continue developing these partnerships and to create that civic web that, um, that Lynn was talking about. Um, we are doing our part as residents, and these organizations are trying to help us with that role, but then these organizations also have uh, decisions and impacts that they make too um, that impact our water resources. So we're lucky to have these partners. 
Um, but the pilot itself, um, so this is the year that I am actually launching a civic organizing approach um, in the Como neighborhood. Um, and, and I'm learning it with Lynn. Um, and what my intention is is to use this approach in how our, the Como Lake Neighbor Network is actually structured, uh, applying the civic principles and standards to how we do our work and make decisions, how we organize the base of neighbors that makes up our network, how we train uh, citizen leaders. So the goal is to develop develop ourselves into a network of neighbors that are, are self-aware of being citizens um, in a governing role um, who have impact on Como Lake, um, and we want that impact to be positive, um, and connecting the governing that we do in Como to a larger civic web of local agencies and organizations, such as the cross-sector list that you saw, um, that also make decisions that have an impact on Como Lake. Um, and we are connected to Lynn and her work in the St. Croix. Uh, and to the other organizations in Mackey because of the fact we are using the same framework uh, to govern together. Um, so just a quick bit about what Lynn's doing. Um, so she also, she's working in the St. Croix Basin uh, with two groups of government agency folks in uh, Kennebec and Mille Lacs counties. Um, they are all uh, trying to collaborate more uh, with one another by using the civic organizing uh, framework and approach. Um, they, there's a, a building in each county where there's a collection of federal, state, um, county uh, government agencies. And so they're all working in the same building, but they don't necessarily work together. Uh, so they want to do that, and they're using this uh, approach to see if they can uh, do that. And then they're testing to see can they get better outcomes in their work uh, that impacts um, the work that they're doing in the Snake River watershed in particular, uh, while at the same time building a, a civic web between agencies. Um, so uh, the participants include, uh, there's a couple of the Um, how they interact with their boards, um, how to apply ultimately that learning um, in their relationships with the residents um, of the Snake River watershed. Um, there's just a quick picture of the Snake River that I snatched from website of Friends of the Snake River. It's a cool website. You guys should go there. Um, so they are, if they're successful in using this approach to work with each other, um, like I said, they hope to use it to bring those impact, most impacted by the problem, which would be the community members who live in the Snake River River watershed. They want to bring those folks into a partnering role um, with with them uh, to get the best bang for our public buck. Um, so just to sum up, um, what we hoped to convey to folks today is the need for some new thinking about how our waters are currently being governed and the ways that uh, this, that governing system needs to change or evolve if we are to get the, the outcomes that we want. Uh, we are proposing a new water governance system uh, that is based on a civic web that connects all of us across sectors in a governing role that is based on our shared role as citizens working together for the common good. Um, and we've shared one possible approach, a civic organizing approach, as a way to organize this civic web in the places where we all have authority to act so we can all be working to protect and restore um, our precious water resources. Thanks. All right, thank you, Janet and Lynn. And so uh, that is the end of the, the formal presentation, but uh, we have plenty of time now for uh, questions. And so uh, go ahead and raise your hand um, in the, the software, and I'll unmute you to uh, ask a question of either of our presenters or even just discussion, uh, thoughts, any discussion that you have. Uh, maybe to kick us off, uh, a quick first uh, question is, that, and this is mostly for Lynn, uh, you know, we all know and uh, very, probably uh, various people who are listening in have uh, seen presentations on the new watershed restoration and protection strategies that is a, a new approach that the um, uh, that the Pollution Control Agency is going to be undertaking. And I guess a, a question is, is how, um, how is something that is looking at a, at a watershed level of planning versus a, uh, a much more, a smaller scale, 
can uh, can work hand in hand with this uh, type of a civic engagement approach, or uh, you know, really trying to get the buy-in to address some of these pollution sources. Uh, is it is it still going to be applicable? And you know, is it going to be uh, uh, potential challenges that are different presented by that type of an approach? I am I. Can you hear me? Um, that's a, a really challenging question. I think we've been uh, working very hard in the organization to ensure that we've, we have changed our civic mindset around how we do watershed work and trying, like I said early in my presentation, to figure out how to embed civic engagement at the very earliest stages and throughout and not seeing civic engagement as a, a separate activity from the technical work being done, but trying to um, see that are as very entwined work and in the earliest years of the watershed approach we're trying to encourage our technical staff to work closely with local work groups so that they're building capacity throughout that first four years of a watershed project by working together to solve problems to understand and define the problems and uh, figure out how they can create that network and web in the community to get work done so I think it had, definitely this work is applicable at a watershed scale, but I think we're, we may find over time that our greatest success is at a smaller scale that kind of builds outward, where you, you know, working where you know you have interested people and you've, you can hit the ground running and working to kind of enhance and enlarge success at a small scale so it builds out into the larger watershed. That's, is that kind of what you were asking me, Daryl? Yeah, I think that's a, uh, exactly what I was getting at is that really the um, you know, what makes sense and is actually off uh, addressing some of the uh, problems that we've had in the past with water uh, resource planning of uh, having too many disjointed plans all running together within a watershed and and within governmental boundaries that don't actually line up with a watershed and but yet uh, some of these solutions uh, have always been and still continue to need to be uh, coming really from the local level. I would I very much agree with that. I think it's going to continue to be a challenge in emerging what the Board of Water and Soil Resources is, is seeking and what our agency needs and we're working hard on that. I think those conversations are occurring. It's probably not going to be seamless for a while, but I think that's what we're trying to attempt to do. It makes sense to do that. Well, uh, another question we have here is, uh, you know, maybe expand a little bit more on the the challenges of uh, of really trying to work on some of the, something like this with communities that, um, you know, the co I guess understanding the capacity of the communities to be able to undertake uh, a new approach like this and. You know, maybe you can talk a, a, either both of you about the uh, ability to gauge that and also build that local capacity. Uh, I could speak a little bit about our experience trying this in, in Kennebec and Mille Lacs counties. I think what we found was there was a lot of, of legwork and or, organizing, kind of one-on-one -on -one organizing that we did trying to determine if that capacity and interest existed in, first we started in Kennebec County, to try something like this. So there were a lot of, you know, one-on-one -on -one meetings and then a community meeting to determine if there was interest in trying this. And I think the, we did a public workshop on this way there were probably 25 people and from there there's been probably somewhere between uh, you know six to ten people that have shown active interest in trying this where they have the authority to act you know that's what we're asking people to do not trying to take on the whole county's problems but their personal sphere of influence and then what happened was that Kelly Osterdyke in Kennebec was able to organize Mille Lacs County to come into this and they've been very interested as well in trying to figure out how to work together across organizations and uh, you know the way we've traditionally structured things so I, I guess that's how we've gone about that I think that's it really the one-on-one -on -one organizing is I'm finding out through learning through about this framework is an incredibly powerful tool to understand the community and how ready they are to try something like this Jana did you want to say anything 
Um, yeah, I think what I would add to that, I'm just thinking about in the in the context in Como where I live and the work that we are doing. When we very first, um, a, a group of neighbors, when we very first formed the Como Lake Neighbor Network, um, it was small, um, and we were really quite pleased to discover that um, a lot of neighbors were interested in, in what we were trying to do. And you know, there is a perception that um, that citizens don't care or that they don't necessarily, you know, want to take on complicated problems or that they, you know, as you're mentioning this word capacity, maybe they don't have the capacity, but we've actually found the reverse to be true. Um, many, many neighbors are interested in in being uh, part of the solution. They they do listen to the education and outreach campaigns, but what's what's been missing is that organizing, that structural component that actually provides um, an organized base of neighbors within the community to actually implement um, a lot of these great ideas that that we've been learning. So that was one important reason for us to put the, the neighbor network together is just so we could actually be collaborating um, and implementing some of these these best management practices. Um, but we've since learned that, you know, as people get involved and they start with those small things, they get more interested in the, in the broader issues. Um, they're interested in, you know, what, what are the policies that actually either inhibit or enhance our ability to be able to do more. Um, and and, you know, we, we find people have a greater interest in taking a deeper role. Um, and so far, we've been lucky. Our, our local government agencies have been very supportive and very interested in working with us. Um, that's not always true um, in some communities, um, but we feel fortunate that that has been the case for us. Um, and we're hoping that that will that interest in in taking you know even deeper um, responsibility, more accountability for helping to solve this problem, that that will continue to increase when. Now that we are really getting serious about this civic organizing framework and really f deliberately framing what we're doing as, you know, from the role, from the identity of citizens, we're not asking people to be volunteers. We're asking people to, you know, to come at this from their identity as a homeowner, as a as a resident, um, a member of a community, a neighbor, um, and and you know, work together so that we're, uh, you know, we're not, we don't want to just do these random acts of of conservation. We want uh, these things that we're doing to actually be an, an organized strategy. Um, so that's the beauty of, of us collaborating, I think. So I think community capacity, um, it may seem like it's not there sometimes when it really is there. It's just that we haven't, we don't have the social structures or the organizing structures in place to actually make it possible for people to take um, public action together. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. And I think when we, in our work in, in, in Kennebec and Mille Lacs, interestingly, pretty much all of the people uh, have the same kind of complaints about why the systems are broken. And a couple of the major ones were that we all work in silos. The way we're structured is makes it extremely challenging to um, work across the organizations, and, and there's no reward for it in the current systems. And secondly, the, the, at the government level, people feeling that they are seeking better ways to engage citizens. They're very stymied by the ways um, ways to do it better. How can they, you know, get people to meetings and have meaningful engagement from them so they get work done on the ground? So I think Jan is right. I think we underestimate how ready people are for this. And um, I think civic organizing is one of the most hopeful models I've run into so far. It presents a really um, very high aspiration but very practical tools to go with it. All right, thanks. Uh, another question here actually is getting a little bit uh, into the impact, the, the real water quality impacts of some of this. And uh, I think, Jenna, you hinted at it uh, some, but really you, you, one of the things that, uh, that Lynn highlighted was with non-point source, the real challenge is, is that these are unregulated. And which that means is that we rely on a system that even, even if there is money and funding available to help people uh, be able to take actions, it still relies on willing landowners. And it also, it both to do the, uh, you know, put in the, the uh, on the ground projects, but it also then depends on uh, ongoing maintenance and just kind of keeping that in the ground. And uh, 
can you talk a little bit of how this uh, goes hand in hand with uh, building that ownership for or kind of part of the problem, but also the solution and help it, how it can help uh, get more and better projects on the ground? Uh, Lynn's looking at me, so <laughs> I think it's your <laughs> um, I think, uh, well, of course, I don't. My experience, of course, is in the urban environment, um, so I, I can probably speak less to uh, what it's like in a, a farming area. Um, but I'm, I'm just thinking that sometimes it is surprising when, when residents are invited, as Lynn mentioned, from the very beginning to actually take part in defining the problem. Problem. Um, what we've discovered is that this problem definition um, is more nuanced. Um, and then from that, um, solutions are developed, um, co-developed, I should say, by members of the community and the experts, uh, the agency staff that are, that are working on the problem. Um, when, when that happens, when citizens are involved in the, the entirety of the process, that experience in itself um, is pretty is really I think critical to developing. That's how ownership is developed. You, you need to have a sense of ownership in the process if you want folks to have a sense of ownership in actually implementing the solution. The it's it's less likely that uh, you can get ownership from community members if if it's the more traditional approach where a plan is developed, you know, by others, um, and especially a plan that involves the solution strategy that require action from the public. Um, if the public hasn't been involved in developing, you know, these things that they are supposed, supposedly supposed to do, um, it feels it, you're, it's harder to get ownership. Um, I, so that's been our experience in Como is that if you involve people in throughout the process um, and they can come up with some pretty creative uh, things that maybe others haven't thought of, um, especially, like I said, when it has to do with, I mean, who better to figure out how to um, create strategies that are going to help residents um, better prevent phosphorus pollution than the residents themselves. Um, so that's been my experience. I, I would agree, and um, I think you know, civic organizing, as we're talking about, it's no bit magic bullet. There's no magic bullet to anything we do. It's complex, and it's hard work, and it takes time. But one of the things I really like about civic organizing as a framework for thinking about governing is that it's a no-blame environment. It, the whole point of it is it tries to move people beyond that to a higher aspiration for democracy, for active citizenship, and trying to get them to think about the common good versus their own self-interest. And that's, you know, that has to happen over time as people use a tool like this. I think that concept comes out very clear and makes people think. And my experience just in the workshop that we held in Connecticut County on this is we, I was talking to a gentleman who has been blaming a farmer for a long time for the lake's problems in their community. And after the meeting, he said, well, I think I've made some mistakes on how I've gone about doing this because he understood that it really is a we, it's a web of blame we're involved in here, and, and no one is uh, guiltless. So that's one of the things I really like about this model. It, it's kind of asked people to move beyond self-interest, and that's one hopeful piece of asking individuals to look at their own behaviors and see how the, what they're doing in their private lives impacts the public good. So will we get better water quality out of this? I don't know, and that's part of why we're doing the pilot in, in trying to figure out if governing better together, using resources better together, and involving the public more gets us better water quality outcomes. I, and I can't say for sure that's going to happen, but I think it's a very important and interesting experiment. All right, thank you, Lynn and Janet. Well, we're uh, coming up at the end of our presentation, and so uh, maybe kind of as a, a couple minutes here, if anybody has a, a last-second question, um, I'll just ask uh, Janet and Lynn if they have any uh, kind of last-minute parting comments and thoughts. Uh, I do. I just want to say how phenomenal it has been over these past few years to be working with Lynn Colsey. <laughs> oh. 
And I, in many ways, I feel like the relationship that Lynn and I have developed is somewhat metaphorical to the relationship that, uh, that I'm hoping that members of the public can to develop with government agencies. I think Lynn has brought me into her, her world, uh, the internal world of, of a state agency, and I've learned an amazing amount about all the, the hard work that's going on there. Um, and, and yet her attitude has always, towards me, has always been so open and and she's so interested in what I'm doing and believes that my role is just as important as hers. Um, and so I, I feel privileged that uh, we've been able to work together, um, the two of us. Well, I'm blushing on my end of things. That's very sweet of Janet to say that. I think she's right that it comes down to relationships. So much of this work comes down to relationships, and that's what gets work done ultimately, and that takes time. And I think that's the thing that a lot of our legislators don't always understand, um, and and even our own agency uh, folks don't always understand that this, this work does take a lot of time and effort, and there are no quick fixes, I don't think for problems that have taken us many, many years to, um, you know, we, well, we, we need a, lo a long time, I guess, a long-term view in order to, to accomplish what we really want to accomplish with water quality. So patience is key and relationships are key.